Ever since they became fugitives, they've been off the grid. No superheroes makes my life easier. What makes you say that? Simple. Superheroes attract supervillains. No heroes, no villains. You need to shut the fuck up. Well, here we are. The newest season of Big Hero 6 The Series has been over for about three months now, and I'm only now talking about it. Well, this video has been a long time coming, hasn't it? It's been about nine months since my last Big Hero 6 The Series video, and like the first one did, it actually did pretty well. At least, for the most part. I will be honest with you guys, though, a part of me kind of regrets making that video. I really should have waited for the whole season to end, or at the very least for the City of Monsters arc to end, because, oh wow, if I had just waited two more weeks, I would have had so much more to work with than what I had. But the video exists, and I got a lot of great comments out of it too. I guess I need to emphasize once again, because people clearly didn't listen to me last time, if you enjoy the show, that's great! That's fine! I'm glad you're able to find something to enjoy out of this mess of a show, but in the same regard, I'm allowed to hate it all I want. And I do. I really do. I honestly don't know why I hate this show as much as I do. Maybe it's because I really wanted to like this show, and I'm just really disappointed in what it's become. Averagely Tall Girl just made me realize the truth. I've been intimidated by how much I actually... Like you. My brain hates my eyes for seeing this. Maybe it's the fact that you have, honestly, two very talented people running the show, and it somehow still sucks. People have said that I should give the show props because Bob and Mark make him possible, and that somehow fixes this show? How? George Lucas may have made Star Wars, but he also made Star Wars. And also Howard the Duck and Strange Magic. Just because someone worked on something good in the past doesn't resolve what they're working on now. Did you guys know that Dave Filoni, the guy pretty much in charge of Star Wars right now, also worked on Avatar in the past? Yeah, fun fact! But despite the fact that both Avatar and Clone Wars were spectacular shows, he also made Rebels, which wasn't that great. He also made Resistance, which I haven't seen yet, but... Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Yeah, it looks like trash. And I've heard from everyone else it is trash. Bob and Mark also worked on the Kim Possible movie, which everyone agrees is pretty much terrible. Their own property, and they couldn't even do that justice. Maybe like George Lucas, whatever they had in the past just isn't there anymore. And if it is still there, then they're definitely not using it here. Maybe I shouldn't have called these two hacks in the past, and I really am sorry for that. That part honestly wasn't even in my script, and I just got angry while recording, and for whatever reason I left that in. I do genuinely believe that Bob and Mark are talented people, and they've proven themselves before in the past, but I just don't think they were the right people for this show. But I'll go more into that later. For now though, we should get started because, oh my god, we have so much to get through. I'll start the video off by talking a bit about the couple things about the show that I actually do like. Not just from season 2, but from the show as a whole. The voice acting's good. Yeah, I actually like the fact that they got the voice actors from the movie to reprise their roles in the show. Well, most of them anyway. I think Carrie Payton. Carrie? Is that how you say his name? The H is silent, right? I could be wrong, I don't know. I think Carrie Payton is a bit distracting as Wasabi because it's literally just Cyborg's voice, but he does his best, I guess. I also like how they didn't bring back TJ Miller because he's a sexist piece of shit and he sucks. The other voice actors are pretty good too in the show despite not having good scripts to work with. Voice direction seems fine, the actor seems fine, it's all good. Globby's fun? I actually really like Globby as a character in this show. While I said in my last video, I thought it was kind of weird that he was just instantly resolved of his crimes in Season 1. With that being said, I like him! I think he's got a genuinely fun personality, he's very likable, and he actually has a real arc in the show compared to everyone else. But I'll go more into that bullshit later. Also, just gonna say this, seriously? You have these two guys who are super in love with each other, but you chose Wasabi to pander with the LGBT community with? Seriously? Just look at these two! Who's ready to decorate some cookies of the gingerbread variety? Oh, me, me, me! I was special. No, no, no. You are special. Oh, thanks, Carl. You're welcome. You're telling me these two ain't gay? If they're not gay, then I ain't straight. I don't know, maybe black gay people are more progressive than white gay people. Being woke is the fucking worst, am I right? Uh, let's see what else in the show do I like. Uh, let me think. Um, the Christmas episode was fine. Mostly. The supervillain Christmas party part was honestly kind of stupid. But the ending was nice. 
just sucks that it took this long to have an actual episode about Tadashi. Sorry, sorry. Positives. Positives. Let's see, what else? What else? The backgrounds are still nice. I'm seriously trying here, guys. Okay, I really am. The show is just not that good. Uncle Samurai? That's pretty clever. I like that. Oh my god, I think that's it. I think that's all that I actually like about this show. It's really not that good, guys. Like, I try, guys. I really did. But that's all the good stuff that I can muster up. But now, let's talk about... Identity is everything. When a TV show or movie has no idea what it is, what it's doing, or why it exists, then it just becomes a waste of time. And ever since the movie came out, Big Hero 6 has had a serious identity crisis. If you saw my review of the movie, you'll remember that I said that the movie was trying too hard to be a superhero movie when it should have just been about Hero and Baymax with superhero elements throughout. Basically, the movie Next Gen was what Big Hero 6 needed to be and should have been. Bob and Mark saw this as an opportunity to make Big Hero 6 into their own creation, and they did. Technically, they did. Bob and Mark said in an interview that this was their first time working on a show with an overarching narrative and plot, and yeah, it really shows. Like I said before, I don't think Bob and Mark were the right choices for the show. When you go over their catalog and what they've worked on before, it really does kind of start making sense. The best shows in their past catalog was Kim Possible and Buzz Lightyear. And do you want to know what made those shows good? They were really good satire. Bob and Mark are especially good at satire. Buzz Lightyear of Star Command is a good example of this. In the Toy Story movies, Buzz Lightyear was just meant to be a stupid Saturday morning cartoon that any little kid would fall in love with. Who he was in the show itself didn't really matter. There's also the fact that Buzz, in a way, was already a satire sci-fi protagonist like Luke Skywalker. Surrender, Buzz Lightyear. I have won. I'll never give in. You killed my father. No, Buzz. I am your father. No! Buzz Lightyear Star Command was a satire of Saturday morning cartoons and sci-fi tropes. And since Buzz was like that in the movie, it makes perfect sense for the show to be just like that too. Then you've got Kim Possible, which was its own original creation, so it can be whatever it wants to be. Kim Possible was a satire of teen rom-coms and spy flicks. Now, combining the two genres together on paper honestly sounds kind of dumb, but Bob and Mark were able to make it work with a good sense of self-awareness and some damn good writing. The chemistry between the characters was always just really on point and very funny. Draken and Shigo pretty much stole the show every time they were on screen. Look, you were uh, obviously upset about your broken nail. Meaning? Uh, you were overreacting. Overreacting? Overreacting? Ah! Me? Ah! Fire in the hole! But again, the word I want to emphasize on is satire. Basically, making fun of the usual cliches you see in these genres. In an interview, Bob and Mark described that working on Big Hero 6 was like getting back to their Kim Possible roots. It's a bit of a reunion for a lot of people who made Kim Possible, and our goal was really to sort of evoke that feeling again. With Kim, it was action, it was comedy, it was heart. And that is definitely what this show is all about. Yeah, I don't think that's a good thing, because Big Hero 6 the movie was pretty damn different from Kim Possible. Sure, it was a pretty lighthearted film, but it still took itself rather seriously. It wasn't a satire of any kind. Honestly, the movie was pretty cliché itself in some areas, like having Hero just suddenly turn evil for a few minutes with very little build-up. But I know what you guys are gonna say. The show doesn't have to be like the movie. It can change and do things differently. You're a fucking asshole. And you're 100% correct on that. If the show was 100% like the movie was, then that too can give the show serious development issues. TV shows that follow a movie need to be able to expand beyond the movie's borders. Take a look at Clone Wars, for example. Remember how much everyone hated Ahsoka Tanu when she first appeared? Remember how stiff and awkward looking the animation was? Now, compare the original movie to season seven. Look at how much everything has changed. It's almost unrecognizable, but in the best way possible. The animation is so crisp and beautiful looking, and Ahsoka went from being one of the most hated characters in Star Wars to one of the most beloved. That is a perfect example of a show reaching beyond the movie's borders, to a point where the movie itself doesn't even compare anymore. 
But with all of that being said, it's still important for a TV show to hold at least some semblance of the movie's spirit and tone. And Big Hero 6 the series doesn't really do that. It actually acts so different from the movie that it's become virtually unrecognizable in the worst way possible. In terms of tone, style, and well, pretty much everything else, it acts so much more like, like, oh, I don't know, like a certain other very popular superhero thing that I didn't really want to talk about, but now I'm kind of forced to. <sighs> okay, here we go. Big Hero 6 the series is one of those shows. Remember when Teen Titans Go first premiered back in 2013 and everybody hated it? Well, turns out that hating something so much can actually have an inverse effect on it. Basically, the more hate the show got, the more popular the show became. Sure, little kids enjoyed it because it really was just made for little kids, but that didn't stop the hate. Nope, it just got worse and worse and worse. Eventually to the point where the writers started using that hate to make themselves stronger. Just like a Sith Lord. So despite all of the hate the show got, Teen Titans Go proved to be a very successful show. Right to the point where Cartoon Network started to milk that cash cow to death. Teen Titans Go was pretty much everywhere for a while, you couldn't escape it. 2017 especially became pretty infamous in Cartoon Network's history, what with their 300 episode marathons and telling everyone it was their new favorite show. Yeah, that shit sucked. And even fans of Teen Titans Go were like, yeah, that was a little much. But enough about that. I've got a pretty hot take for you guys to hear. Or at least it would have been a hot take if I had said this back in 2015 or something. Whether you like Teen Titans Go or not, whether you enjoy the show yourself or absolutely despise it like most people, and I'm not going to lie here, it's certainly not my favorite show, no matter how you feel about the show, Teen Titans Go is allowed to be what it is. Or, depending on how you feel about it, what it's trying to be. Teen Titans Go is a spin-off show, meaning it has virtually nothing to do with the original Teen Titans show. It doesn't erase it, it doesn't change it, it's simply trying to be its own thing, for better or for worse. The only thing that it has in common with the original show is that it got the original voice actors from the original show to come back for it. But I know what you're thinking. But why, Razorblade? Why is Teen Titans Go allowed to be what it is, but Big Hero 6 the series needs to be like the movie? Well, I'm getting to it. Just hang on a second. So, as we've established, Teen Titans Go was a very popular show. And when something becomes very popular, eventually, you're going to get people trying to cash in on that trend. These are those shows. The Powerpuff Girls 2016... The Powerpuff Girls 2016 was an utter empty shell of a reboot, with really cheap looking animation, laughably bad writing, and... It's party time! Yeah, who could forget that? There was a lot of modern humor that felt really dated, like they used memes and shit. There was also a bunch of vague, empty messages about female empowerment, while at the same time, the show was being very sexist to both the original voice actors of the girls and the characters within the show. Remember when Miss Bellum got wrote off the show for sexist reasons? Or Miss Keen losing her fucking boobs? Seriously, what was that about? Remember when one of the writers self-inserted himself as a love interest for a supposedly five-year-old girl? Yeah, that was weird. The whole show was like that. Ben 10 2016. Ben 10 2016 was another one of those shows, trying desperately hard to be something that it wasn't, being a loud, in-your-face, comedy-oriented show with cheap-looking flash animation, a bunch of modern references and humor, again, just like a certain other show. Also, can we talk about Max's new voice actor? Like, <laughs> seriously, they didn't even try to find a guy that sounded like Paul Edding. I'd be mad at you two for sneaking off if I wasn't so impressed by what you did for those hikers. Way to focus, kids. Yeah, fuck this show too. Thundercats roar. Oh, God. Oh, do I even need to talk about this show? I think the internet has already done its duty with this one. What a great idea it was to give the job to a guy who would later admit that he hates Thundercats and is basically going out of his way to destroy it. And this is coming from someone who has never cared about Thundercats. Like, ever. Like, I don't care about it. I never watched the original Thundercats. I never watched the 2011 reboot. I just, I just don't care, really, honestly. But with that being said, I do understand how it feels to have something you love very much be completely and utterly destroyed right before your very eyes. 
and shit like this? You've shown me that Thundercat's roar is a worthy successor, and anyone who says otherwise has a poop mouth with poop opinions. Really is just fanning the flames at this point. And in case you were wondering, yes, Big Hero 6 also stoops to the level of telling critics to basically go fuck themselves, but I'll dive into that bullshit later. So yeah, these shows are pretty terrible and don't really have that much love for them. However, despite all the hate, despite all of the negativity that these shows have gotten, like Teen Titans Go, they are allowed to be what they are. Now, don't get it twisted, guys. That doesn't mean these shows are good by any means, or even rebooting shows like this in general is a good idea. I'm just saying, these shows themselves do not particularly tarnish nor destroy the original properties. The original Pop of Girls is still a fun, great show. Ben 10 was pretty good for a while, until Ultimate Alien, where everything started going downhill from there. And yes, Thundercats is still beloved by millions. And there's plenty of evidence to prove it. There are three words that I want to emphasize with this section of the review. Understanding these words are very crucial when it comes to deciphering what is truly wrong with Big Hero 6 the series. Those three words are satire, spin-off, and reboot. All of those shows fall under at least one of those categories. Satire focuses on making fun of the tropes usually seen in a certain genre. A spin-off is when a show, while having a few similarities with a property, makes enough significant changes to its own source material to make it its own thing. And finally, a reboot is when something is completely reborn to become something entirely new. So now, the question comes to mind, what category does Big Hero 6 the series fall under? Well, none of them. Yeah, it doesn't really fall under any of those things. The movie wasn't a satire of anything, so I don't understand why the show would take such a sudden shift in that direction. It's not a spin-off series, nor is it a reboot. Nope, it is a sequel series. It picks up immediately where the movie left off, it brings up events from the movie, and the events from the movie still have repercussions in the show. This is basically my biggest problem with Big Hero 6 the series. Like the movie, it is trying way too hard to be something it is not. Despite being a sequel series, the show acts nothing like the movie did, or at the very least, it very rarely does. Like those shows, Big Hero 6 has a lot of modern talk. Oh, you're giving me all the feels. It's completely optional, no press. Is shortening words still a thing? Oh, totes. I hate that kid. Yeah, you really shouldn't let him get to you, Freddy. He's just trolling you. And pop culture references like, Oh guys, we're going through the second phase now. Do you get it? Do you guys get it? It's the second season, so we're going to be calling it the second phase. Do you fucking get it, kids? Yeah, I get it. And the second phase of the MCU has been over for years at this point. You know, this is just like the scene in Ranger Stranger issue 233 where the Ranger and the police chief realize they both have a mother, so they agree to let all their differences go. Yeah, that's not happening. Do you get it, guys? D do you remember that? Do you remember the whole Martha thing? Do you get it? God, I wish I wish Fred would just fucking die at this point. Like, seriously, I, I fucking hate him so much. He's, like, easily the most annoying character in the show, honestly. I understand that sequel shows are going to take chances and change things up a bit. If anything, it's both expected and even encouraged. But at the same time, if you go too far in a different direction to the point where you're trying to have the best of both worlds, then you're just going to end up making a mess. The show wants to have the heart that the movie had, but the absurdly fast-paced and constant gags just make the whole experience feel rather ingenuine. You don't need to have a joke every five seconds, guys. You can let the moment play out by itself. The boy needed limits. I did not provide them. It was a mistake I never wanted to make again. However, it seems I have. His real name's Bob? Oh my god, Fred, just shut up, okay? Just shut the fuck up! Oh, nobody was fucking talking to you! Big Hero 6 The Series is just another one of those shows. But unlike the other shows, Big Hero 6 The Series doesn't have the same freedom as those shows. Being a sequel series to a movie that's nothing like Kim Possible, but also trying to be Disney's equivalent to that show, just makes the whole show feel confused. When it comes to tone, it's just an utter mess. It begs to be like the movie, but Bob and Mark wanted to be more like Kim Possible. But Disney probably intervened, saw the whole superhero thing, and decided it needed to be like Teen Titans Go in order to cash in on the trend. So you basically have a show that's trying to be three things all at once. 
It can't be a full-on comedy show because the movie wasn't like that. It can't have too much action because Teen Titans Go isn't like that. It can't take itself too seriously because Kim Possible wasn't like that. See? You see what I'm talking about? The show is all over the fucking place. It has no idea what it wants to be. The new Star Wars movies suffer from a very similar problem. After not having a plan, letting two directors basically just fight it out like two kids on the playground over a toy, and trying really hard to make Star Wars into the new Marvel, you had something that started off with some promise, but just became confused, aimless, boring, rushed, and just feels overall like a really bad fan fiction. And I think that's why I really hate this show as much as I do. Like the new Star Wars movies, I really did want to like it. And to its credit, it's not the worst thing ever. Power of Girls 2016 and Thundercats Roar are way worse than Big Hero 6 is. But at the same time, it suffers from the same problem the movie did. It's trying way too hard to be something it's not, and what it ended up being is just not very good at all. And I haven't even gotten into Season 2 yet, which most fans agree is actually worse than Season 1, which, considering what I said about Season 1, is not a good sign. What do I mean by that? Well, let's get into the meat of it, finally. I really don't feel like repeating myself. I feel like I've pretty much said everything that I wanted to about these characters in the last two videos, so I won't spend too much time on it here. But basically, to sum it all up again, I really don't like these characters. They're really bland, one-dimensional, not that charismatic, and not that funny. Remember when the writers said that they wanted to develop these characters and give them more depth and purpose into the show? Yeah, me too! Mark said that the series would be a good opportunity to be a launching point for these characters and take them in the new directions. The problem with that, however, is that whatever development these characters get, it never fucking sticks! Whatever development these characters learn, be it about accepting yourself, sympathizing with people you don't like, accepting your own limitations, stuff that's actually really good stuff to learn, literally gets forgotten about by the next episode. This is a problem with the show trying to be three different shows all at once. Shows like Kim Possible and Teen Titans Go, for example, are mostly pretty episodic. Sure, there's continuity in those shows, but I think there's a difference between simply having continuity and actually having an overarching story. Continuity often just means that stuff that happens in the show gets brought up again because it just so happened to have happened. But an overarching story, on the other hand, actually focuses on what happened. How the events within the story actually changes a character, or the world, or even the galaxy, is explored and used to advance it, as opposed to a show with just continuity. Sure, things happen in them, but every episode is usually just its own thing that can often be isolated from the other episodes. As I said before, Big Hero 6 the series is trying to have it both ways. It has an overarching story, but it writes its characters and the world building like they're purely episodic. Things that happen to the characters, with the occasional exception here and there, often are just focused on in one episode, but then the show just resets back to the status quo by the next episode. Remember Gogo's love for bird watching? Yeah, that's never brought up again. Honey Lemon's love for the arts? It's been reduced to a running gag now. This leads to a serious consistency problem within the show itself, because as the story progresses with the main antagonist and hero, all of the other characters are just being left behind. This also makes things just straight up confusing. Do you guys want to know how many episodes Wasabi has to himself in the show? One. Just one. He had that tag-along thing with Hero in Season 1, so that doesn't count. This was the first and so far only episode in the show that Wasabi actually got to himself. I pointed this out in my Season 1 video that Wasabi was the most pointless character in the show and he still is. The fact that it took this long to give him his own episode, and the fact that it's near the very end of season two, and the fact that it's nothing but a filler episode, pretty much tells you everything you need to know about how the writers feel about Wasabi. Fucking Aunt Cass and Alistair Cray have more episodes dedicated to them than Wasabi has. Man, he really is just a cheap marketing tool, isn't he? So in his filler episode, Wasabi has to get over his fear of crowds and public speaking, and eventually, he does, for that one singular moment where it matters. And then, literally two episodes later, he has another stage fright moment. Because I guess the writers thought it'd be really funny if Wasabi forgot about whatever development he learned in that one episode for the sake of a cheap gag. You see what I'm talking about, guys? Chief Cruz learns to accept heroes by the end of the season, and that's supposed to stick, but Wasabi just forgets about his lesson because the writers thought it'd be funny? Do you see how confusing that sounds? 
Fred learns how to sympathize with Richardson Mole because he finds out that Mole is just a really lonely kid with no real friends. That'd be actually kind of cool if Fred didn't just start hating on the kid the literal next time he saw him. Turns out he collects to fill a friendship void. <sighs> I felt bad for the little jerk, so I let him keep them. Yeah, Fred, you do realize that doesn't change what you know about him. Like, if anything, it kind of explains why he's such a dick. Honey Lemon and Gogo literally just go through the same story arc they went through in the first season again. I'm not even kidding. Gogo and Honey Lemon are very different people. Gogo doesn't like that and has trouble getting along with Honey Lemon. Honey Lemon then suddenly announces that she's leaving, and then Gogo is just suddenly upset about it. Like, yeah, it's actually super forced the way Gogo is just suddenly sad to hear the fact that Honey Lemon is leaving the apartment. You can't have Gogo be super pissed off about Honey Lemon and then suddenly have her be sad about her leaving. Have Honey Lemon leave first and then have Gogo be sad that she's gone. Show, don't, tell, but whatever. Bottom line, Gogo learns to appreciate Honey Lemon's differences. And you see, I told you it's the same fucking thing as before. Maybe not to a T, but it was still the same lesson they learned already. You see what I'm talking about, guys? You can't just pick and choose what does get development and what doesn't in a show with an overarching narrative. If anything, it's important that a character's development and the story are tied together. If you want a smaller side story to develop the characters from time to time, that's fine, but Hiro is the only character whose story is actually tied to the actual narrative of the show. Everyone else in Big Hero 6 is just a second thought. Just like with the movie, guys, the side characters don't fucking matter. I get that Hero is the main character and all, but this show is called Big Hero 6 The Series. Everyone in the show needs the same amount of development and consistency. Otherwise, the show just ends up feeling confused and inconsistent. And unlike the movie where there's only an hour and a half of runtime, with the show, you have a ton of time, so there's no fucking excuse. Seriously guys, I don't even know how to talk about both Tadashi and Baymax. Both characters just feel so much like an afterthought in the show, it's not even funny. Baymax and Hero's relationship, which was the forefront of the movie, is hardly ever focused on. Usually Baymax is there just for the simple purpose of having him misinterpret something to be funny, make a health fact to be funny, or just blow air because, you guessed it, to be funny. When it's never fucking funny. It was never funny to begin with. He's literally become nothing more than just a walking punching bag at this point. Either that, or he's just a plot device that's good for just randomly bringing up Tadashi whenever the show needs a cheap emotional moment. By the way, that's what Tadashi has pretty much become in the show. If you saw my review for the movie, then you'll know that I never really cared for Tadashi that much. He just seemed a little too friendly and bland for my liking. But to be fair, for what he was supposed to do in the movie... He played that role very well. However, the show was a perfect opportunity to flesh out Tadashi's character, maybe explore his relationship with the other characters, or his aunt. Why not talk about his and Hiro's real parents, their childhood, anything that would be interesting to see? Nope, Tadashi has just become nothing more than a gimmick at this point. Whenever the show needs some cheap, forced, emotional moment, the show will either have Baymax, and Cass, Hero or any of the other teammates just bring him up out of nowhere because the writers have no idea or interest in what to actually do with him. Yeah, I get he's dead, but the Christmas episode had a flashback. Baymax plays videos of Tadashi from time to time. So what the hell's up? You clearly still want him to be in the show, but you barely use him at all. Why not give us a whole flashback episode to explore Hero and Tadashi's relationship? Maybe right after their parents died? That'd be a great idea! But no, fuck that. Just give us a super villain Christmas party because that's not the stupidest fucking thing ever. How am I supposed to take any of this shit seriously? I ask you. Professor Granville has also been pretty much sidelined in this season. Remember how in season one she had that character arc with Obake and she kind of became Hero's mentor and stuff? Yeah, well, the writers don't. Instead, she's barely even in the show at all anymore. In the second episode of this season, Granville tries to help Big Hero 6 from behind the scenes, and she was actually pretty good at it. I thought maybe this would become her new role, becoming the Charlie to these kids' angels. But no, that never happens. She pretty much just disappears after that episode, not having any real impact in the show whatsoever, save for a brief gag or appearance here and there. Like, it's pretty much become a cameo at this point, seriously. All the other characters in the show pretty much go through the same thing, really. Most of the villains, like Baron Von Steamer, Yama, and Hart... <sighs> hard light. Seriously, guys, you have a video game based villain and you don't call him Killstreak. It's literally there for the taking. It's the first thing that comes to mind. Just, what are you guys thinking? Hardcore. High school. I am Hard Light. <laughs> Is that a name? Oh, you made fun of your terrible writing. Oh, okay then. 
Now it's just suddenly okay! Yeah, I forgot that's how it worked. These villains are mostly just villain of the week who serve just to be the bad guy for the episode and nothing more. I usually don't care as for what they are, they're fine. But then the show just suddenly gives Momakaze a backstory? Like, what? Yeah, she was one of those villains of the week with no real death or anything like that, and now suddenly she just has a backstory? Now keep in mind, she's actually tried to kill Big Hero 6 in the past at some points, and had no problem doing it either. But now she's suddenly relatable? And even redeemable? What? Where does this even come from? There was no build up to this, no foreshadowing, and nothing at all! You can't just suddenly do something like this. Like seriously, imagine if Frieza just suddenly had a soft story about his mommy dying, and now Momokaze has this sword that was a family heirloom and she needs heroes help to get it back and now she's just suddenly this honorable person and promises to keep their identities a secret. Like, is this even the same character anymore? What the fuck? But hey, at least Momokaze has a backstory now. As for the main villains of the season, well, let's talk about Attack of the Clones now. I am aware that I am an asshole, I really don't care. Liv Amara, oops, <laughs> sorry, my bad. Diana Amara is an incredibly uninspired and lame villain that doesn't hold a candle to Obake. I'm not gonna act like Obake was a fantastic villain, and I'm not gonna lie, his endgame made no sense. Like, all he wanted to do was make Granville proud, right? Wasn't he making the star because that's what he was always trying to do? Nope. Turns out he just wanted to destroy the city and make a whole new utopia out of it because he was fucking crazy. Wow, way to ruin all that build-up and foreshadowing. But to be fair, for the most part, he was still pretty good. Also, half his face got blown off, so come on, cut him a break. Especially considering the fact that Diane is the absolute worst. For those of you who don't watch the show, you lucky bastards, you're probably wondering why I called her Liv in the last video, and now I'm calling her Diane. Well guys, as it turns out, Liv Amara wasn't actually Liv Amara, but Diane Amara instead. Now, why did she lie about her real name? Well, she didn't, because it's not her. She's a clone. Yeah, a fucking clone. A fucking evil clone. I'm dead serious. I'm Diane. You can call me Di. No. No, I don't think I will. You want to know what I guessed when they were building this shit up? I guessed Jealous Evil Twin. Yeah, I know that's cliche too, but what else could it have been? Certainly not this! I thought Diane was just Liv's twin sister who was either jealous of her sister's success and was trying to steal it for herself, or maybe she was trying to ruin it. My mind never thought of Evil Clone because I, for one, thought that would be too stupid. But no, the writers genuinely surprised me with this one. They actually used the Evil Clone cliche. And it makes no fucking sense. This is a joke. This has literally become a meme. This is such an outdated cliche that no one uses it anymore. At least unironically. I'm honestly baffled. I really was not expecting the writers to stoop to this low of a level. Are you guys really just that uninspired? Do you seriously have no ideas with what to do with this show? No ideas at all? This is Marvel! Marvel's been killing it with villains the last couple of years. Even you guys have had a pretty good villain in your show, so what's going on? What's the excuse this time? So, as it turns out, the real Liv Amara was working on a germ designed to help extend life expectancy in humans, but it backfired and now the germs are killing her. Because she apparently told no one else about this in her giant as fuck company, she resorts to cloning herself because she doesn't trust anyone with this but her. Already sounds pretty damn stupid, but okay. So yeah, this whole thing sounds kind of familiar if you watch enough Batman. It's bad enough that you guys resorted to using one of the most outdated cliches in the book, but you also just blatantly ripped off another way better villain than yours. For those of you in the comments that say I should respect the hard work that goes into the show, you guys could kiss my ass. I'm not going to give anyone props if the hard work they put into the show is still sloppy work. I expect quality, damn it. And what I'm getting from these writers is borderline plagiarism. In my last video, I talked about how Liv was acting like the show's equivalent to Lex Luthor. But now I see that she's supposed to be a bit of a fusion between both him and Mr. Freeze. Which is incredibly stupid because both Lex Luthor and Mr. Freeze are both completely different villains. 
Lex Luthor is a greedy, power-hungry megalomaniac who pretty much wants to just take over the world. My campaign is a farce, a small part of a much grander scheme. Do you know how much power I'd have to give up to be president? That's right, conspiracy buff. I spent $75 million on a fake presidential campaign. All just to tick Superman off. Mr. Freeze, on the other hand, simply just wants to save his wife from dying. I can only beg your forgiveness and pray you hear me somehow. Some place. Some place where a warm hand waits for mine. My award. The equipment. It's all gone. I can't save you. Maybe there's another way. Victor, this isn't you. I won't let you destroy yourself anymore. I don't want you to die, Nora. Then let me live. One villain is operating for selfish desires and won't let anything or anyone get in his way, and Mr. Freeze is just a desperate man who's willing to do whatever it takes to save his wife. The reason why I bring this up is because Diane's backstory is Mr. Freeze's, but her personality fits more like Luther's. Basically, Diane is a sociopath who doesn't really care about innocent lives. She sees pretty much everyone around her as expendable and can be thrown away whenever they prove not to be useful anymore. So, like Lex Luthor, we're supposed to see her as a villain we don't agree with, but they're just so damn charming and so damn good at being evil that you can't just help but love them anyway, right? Well, there's two problems with that. Number one, Diane is not charming. The only reason she's getting away with it is because literally everyone in San Francisco outside of Big Hero 6 is a fucking moron. Remember that episode of the Powerpuff Girls when the girls got so fed up with how incompetent the citizens of Townsville were that they decided not to do anything when a monster attacked the city? So then when the monster, through sheer dumb luck, got caught up in some power lines, the girls had to tediously walk the citizens through how to destroy the monster themselves? The whole joke of that episode was basically how stupid the citizens of Townsville was. But in Big Hero 6 the series, the citizens of San Francisco is like that unironically. Whenever a villain shows up to destroy shit, they just sit back and watch like it's a sporting event. When weird little creatures take over the city, they take them home as pets and take selfies with them and shit. Yeah, I get that they're cute and all, but they're still weird looking creatures that these people should at least be thinking twice about even touching. They really are as brain dead as the citizens of Townsville are, but at least the citizens of Townsville like the Powerpuff Girls. Every time Big Hero 6 gets humiliated or defeated, the citizens sometimes end up making fun of them. Big Hero 6 is really Big Coward 6. Ah, is it true you're considering changing your name to Big Coward 6? I'll ask this one more time. Why does Big Hero 6 care about the city when the people do not appreciate them? Yeah, I get why they want to help people. Actually, scratch that. I get why Hero and Fred want to help people. Baymax is just following this programming, but there are times when the other characters could honestly care less about being heroes. Gogo, Honey Lemon, and Wasabi mostly just see it as a chore, like they're being forced to do it. And whenever they have something else planned, they often choose that instead. There was a bank robbery last night. Maybe those were the getaway cars. One way to find out. Night Patrol. I feel terrible, but I can't make it. I'm throwing a sticker party. Oh, so stickers are literally more important to you than saving lives? Yeah, good to know. Since we've been laying low, we were actually able to finish our final projects early. Yeah, we can graduate without any supervillain interruptions. Yay. Turns out you can get a lot done when you're not protecting the entire city. Well, I'm glad you got your homework done, Gogo. I mean, sure, an orphanage burned down last night with all the kids still inside, but hey. At least you got your homework done. I'm proud of you. Not only does this make our characters kind of unlikable whenever they choose their petty hobbies over helping people, but it also makes the battle to protect San Francisco feel pretty disingenuous. Why should I care about what happens to the city when the heroes themselves don't seem to care? Why should I give a shit when the idiots that don't even like the heroes all that much end up falling for Diane's super obvious schemes? Why is literally any of this happening? The show cares so much more about what's going on that it never even bothered to ask why it's going on. Which leads me to number two. Diane is evil. Why? Why is she such a sociopath? All she wants to do is save Liv, right? That's literally why she was created. So why does she just immediately start turning people into monsters and sicking them onto the city? Yeah, I get that she's an evil clone, but that's not enough of a reason. That's literally just saying she's evil because... 
frankly, it just doesn't make any sense. If she's supposed to be like Mr. Freeze, then shouldn't she be trying to save her the right way first, with research and hard work, and then just gradually becoming more and more desperate? She doesn't even try to do things the right way first, she just immediately starts being evil, and actually gets a kick out of being evil! But why?! The word underdeveloped doesn't even begin to describe Diane. She wants to save a life, but at the same time, she's perfectly okay with having the whole city be destroyed just to save that one life. Now, to be fair, that could actually work, since we've seen it work before, blatantly so. But like the show's tone, Diane is just a really confused character. Am I supposed to love how evil she is? No, because given what she's fighting for, it makes no sense why she would be so sociopathic. Is she supposed to be a sympathetic villain? No, because there's no inner conflict in her head saying that what she's doing is wrong. She loves being evil, but she also cares about this one particular life. This is what I meant when I said that you can't combine these two villains, because Lex Luthor and Mr. Freeze are two completely, fundamentally different characters. You can't have Diane want to save Liv and at the same time enjoy ruining lives because it gives the audience whiplash. Either have her just want to destroy the city because fuck it, or show us the desperation in Diane's desire to save her creator. But the show does neither of these things. Just pick one of these two things and stick with it, goddammit. Diane would still suck, but at least she would be a hell of a lot more consistent. For fuck's sake, at the end of the City of Monsters arc, Diane turns Carmi into a monster and has her kidnap Hero. But first, a momentary pause to enjoy Carmi's suffering. Anyway, so Diane tells Hero about the germs inside of Liv, and since Hero is such a great hero that actually wants to help people, it's obvious that he has to be FORCED to save Liv. Like, you could just ask him nicely, you don't have to do any of this, like, being evil is so fucking pointless. Oh, and to make things worse, after Hero and Baymax successfully save Liv's life, do you want to know how Diane thanks Hero? By trying to kill him. Yeah! Thank you for helping me fulfill my entire purpose in life. Now, if you could just do me this little favor and stand still so I can fucking murder you, bitch! Seriously, what the fuck? Yeah, she says Hero's a loose end, but by this point, everyone was already figuring out about you anyway, so shouldn't you just be happy that Liv is okay? As I said before on this channel, it's better to be evil than have some fucking common sense. Speaking of Liv Amara, anyone else think it's kind of weird how she just completely disappears from the show after this episode? Yeah, she just vanishes! The bitch almost died and she was the focal point of the entire arc. And yet, after she's saved, no one ever talks about her again. Like, yeah, we never find out how she's doing. Does she go to the hospital? Does she continue to run the company? Like, seriously, what happened to Liv? Shouldn't we at least get some kind of closure? I can't believe Liv- You mean die. No, 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 don't you fucking say that, Gogo. Don't you fucking call her that, you whore! Do not give the writers that kind of gratification! They do not deserve it! But no, we gotta learn how Carmi's doing. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure, she got turned into a monster. But at the same time, again, Liv was the focal point of the whole arc. Imagine if Eerie just disappeared after she was rescued by Mirio and Midoriya. It'd be the most unsatisfying thing in the world. But no, Carmi's what's important here. And learning that she moved away at the end is the real tragedy here. As much as I want to celebrate this, let's be honest with ourselves, these writers are too damn proud of Carmi, so she's most likely just going to come back by Season 3 anyway. Why? Because the writers suddenly had her and Hero become interested in each other like fucking magic. I'm really sorry about Tadashi. I always admired him. If you respected Tadashi all along, then why have you been bullying his little brother this whole time, Carmi? Ya whore! Overall, Diana Mara? Not a fun villain. She makes no sense, is inconsistent, and frankly, compared to Obake, lacks presentation! She's just a really serious downgrade overall. And do you want to know what the worst part of it is? She's not even the worst villain in the show. Fuck the police coming straight from the underground. A young nigga got it bad cause I'm brown. So stop me if you've heard this one before. <clears throat> There's a new police chief in town, but he doesn't like super- It's time to stop! Yeah, of course you're stopping me, because WHO THE FUCK HASN'T SEEN THIS BEFORE?! The police officer that doesn't like superheroes is probably one of the oldest tropes in any superhero anything. Comic books, TV shows, movies, video games, you name it. 
I mean, sure, we still see it every once in a while because it's just that iconic whenever it comes to having a superhero story. Jim Gordon is probably the most famous example of this trope. It's almost impossible to make a Batman anything without Jim Gordon at least making a cameo or something in there. You also have Gwen Stacy's dad, you have Mom Morales' dad. Hey, that's two cops for the same hero right there. Basically, most heroes have to face at least one cop that doesn't like them or agree with their actions. Now, usually, the cops have a good reason for not liking heroes. They don't agree with the vigilanteism, they think they're causing more harm than good, sometimes heroes cause a lot of destruction. Good examples of this can be seen in movies like The Incredibles or in TV shows like the 90s Batman animated series. Now, as we all know, cliches are not automatically bad. What matters is what you bring that's new to the table. How do you make this cliché new and interesting? The same rule applies to Diane too, but yeah, they didn't do that very well with her as I've already explained. So now the question is, how did this show do with Chief Cruz? He's an asshole. Yeah, he sucks. And not for the reasons you think. Usually police officers have a good reason for not liking heroes, and oftentimes the audience can sometimes get behind and even agree with them to an extent. I mean, this guy swings in once a day, zip zap zap in his little mask and answers to no one, right? Yeah, Dad, yeah. And meanwhile, my guys are out there, yeah. lives on the line. Uh -huh. But Chief Cruz's biggest issue is his motivation to not like heroes makes no sense at all. I feel like the writers really wanted the audience to hate this character because wow is it easy to hate this character. Nobody likes Chief Cruz, okay? Seriously, I could not find one single person who actually likes this character. Die-hard fans of this show do not like this character. People who think Carmi is a likable and well-written character do not like Chief Cruz, okay? That says everything! I know the fans of this show have been very patient with me, so it must be pretty gratifying that we can at least come together on this. So Chief Cruz believes that superheroes attract supervillains automatically. Just by existing. Like, all you need to do is put on a pair of tights and a cape, and people will just automatically want you dead. That's his logic. I mean, sure, it's a bit more complicated than that, but that's basically it. First of all, that's stupid. This isn't fucking Dragon Ball where people are just flying around looking for a random fight. Villains usually just exist too. In fact, every villain in the show existed for things like money or simply wanting to destroy the city. Not one villain in the show exists for the sole purpose of fighting big heroes. Yeah, no, you don't count. Funny how in literally the same episode that Chief Cruz says this, Superheroes attract supervillains? No heroes, no villains. A new villain appears with the sole purpose of wanting to fight Big Hero 6 and nothing else. Almost like it justifies Cruz's stupid motivation. That still makes no fucking sense. This is literally the definition of a plot contrivance. It just makes Hardlight's entire role in the show up to this point feel forced and out of nowhere. But whatever, you're probably wondering to yourselves, why does Chief Cruz really not like heroes? It can't be that reason, right? I mean, it really doesn't make any sense. Well, believe it or not, Chief Cruz actually does have a backstory. Quite a rare feat in the show. This makes him, what, the fourth character in the show to have one? Meanwhile, most of the other characters still have Jack to work with. So it turns out that when Cruz was a kid... Actually, you know what? I'll let him explain it for us. It's just so brief and everything, I probably don't have to edit it. I was a kid when Boss Awesome first showed up in the city. And so did a bunch of bad guys all wanted to be the one to beat him. One night, on the way home from a movie, my dad and I got in the way of a supervillain. Dad saved me, but he paid the ultimate price. Boss Awesome showed up too late. I lost everything. So, yep, Boss Awesome... God, I fucking hate that name so much. I mean, seriously, did a fucking five-year-old come up with that? Seriously? Anyway, so a villain killed Chief Cruz's father, and Boss Awesome didn't show up in time to save the day. So, clearly it was the hero's fault, right? I'm starting to see why even diehard fans don't like this character. Even with his backstory explained, he still makes no sense. How can he blame the hero for something a villain did? Shouldn't he be hating supervillains instead? Hell, Chief Cruz literally says this immediately afterwards. Superheroes can't save everyone. I know you've lost people too. Then why are you mad? If you understand that heroes can't save everybody, then why are you mad? Yeah, he says that villains showed up to fight Boss Aw- oh, Fuck, I, I can't say it. I'm sorry. It's just so goddamn stupid. Okay, I'm gonna call him Stan Lee from now on because that's the guy who voices him and that's the name of a real hero, so... Anyway, let's start over. Yeah, Cruz says that villains showed up to fight Stan Lee, but it still isn't well explained. 
Who were these villains? Why do they want to fight him? I think this stuff gets a little more complicated than just, he's a hero so they just want to kill him for no good reason and that's it. Speaking of which, who was the villain that killed your dad? Did Stan Lee ever catch him and defeat him? These are questions that seriously need to be answered. If you want people to side with you, man, this backstory is seriously lacking any depth or even common sense. It's kind of like Evelyn from The Incredibles 2, only way worse. A villain killed my father, and it's all the hero's fault. That's why I'm going to keep heroes illegal forever, even though they already are illegal. At least Evelyn made a good point as to why society shouldn't rely too much on heroes, so even if it is still kind of stupid, she at least has a good point in her defense. Superheroes keep us weak! In literally the same episode that we get Chief Cruz's backstory, later on, he just falls back on the whole heroes are causing more harm than good argument, which completely contradicts the backstory he gave us earlier. Big Hero 6 have kind of saved a lot of people. I'm sure Big Hero 6 have good intentions, but they're harming more than they're helping. And I'll do whatever it takes to protect Megan and all the citizens of San Francisco. Yeah, notice how Chief Cruz didn't give any examples to his logic? Chief Cruz is full of shit and everyone knows it. Chief Cruz can't even stay consistent with his own fucking backstory. And you expect people to actually relate with this character and want him to change? It's not gonna fucking happen, dude. I think the writers were trying to create a new take on the police officer trope that we haven't seen before, since the writers are constantly bringing it up as a running gag. Big Hero 6 is facing even more powerful villains and the police have turned against you. Classic Phase 3 complications. That's what I've been saying! I'm gonna call Child Protective Services! It's time to stop! They wanted to, you know, subvert our expectations in a way, but as I think literally everyone else on the internet has established at this point, subverting expectations does not automatically mean good writing. He makes no sense, and at times can even be hypocritical to his own beliefs. I get that the writers didn't want us to like this character in the first place, but why shouldn't we like this character? You're going for the whole redemption thing, right? So shouldn't the audience want Chief Cruz to be redeemed? It kind of makes the whole redemption thing feel wrong when the whole audience doesn't agree or see his side of things. Zuko's redemption arc was so good and believable because we saw his side of things and understood why he was the way he was. He was just a teenager trying to regain everything he lost. He believed that his honor could only be restored by his father and that's it. He had to learn that honor is something you give yourself. Zuko spends the entirety of the show learning that lesson and then putting it into action. In every step along the way, audiences were both understanding of him and even rooting for him, both when he made mistakes that took him down the wrong path and when he finally came around and decided to teach Aang firebending. Because I could never get behind Chief Cruz's reasoning for hating heroes, his whole redemption arc just feels rather forced and unnatural. It literally ends in the most predictable and unsatisfying way possible. I'm willing to bet all of you can figure out how his character arc is going to end. If you've ever seen any cop that doesn't like a hero story, then you can probably figure out where this is going. I'll give you guys a hint. Chief Cruz has a daughter that he loves very much named Megan. That's all you guys get, and I'm pretty sure it's more than enough. I'll give you guys a few seconds to figure it out. You figured it out, didn't you? In the last episode of the season, Megan gets kidnapped by a supervillain, and Big Hero 6 saves her. They bring her back, and suddenly Chief Cruz has a change of heart and doesn't hate heroes anymore. It's the most bullshit, predictable thing this show has given us so far, and that is saying a lot. Funny how they tried subverting our expectations with this character, but then they just wrapped it up in the most pathetically cliched way possible. Chief Cruz barely even cares. He's like, oh, thanks for saving my daughter. I was wrong. You guys really are heroes after all. And then Hero takes off his helmet for some reason because, well, I guess they just trust him now? Like, what? And, and again, Chief Cruz doesn't even fucking care, like at all. He seriously just brushes off learning their secret identities like it's no big deal. This shit was so fucking rushed. It feels so unearned and even really hypocritical. Throughout the whole season, Big Hero 6 saved a bunch of people and even Chief Cruz at one point, and he doesn't care at all. But now that Megan was saved, suddenly heroes are cool? Chief Cruz's change of heart was only motivated by his own selfish desires. Yeah, I get that Megan was important to him and all, but wasn't the city too? Or, or everyone else that Big Hero 6 saved? Were they just not as important? It kind of makes Chief Cruz look like an asshole, honestly. An asshole that makes no sense, only cared about his own selfish personal grudges, and changed on a literal dime. I feel nothing for Chief Cruz's change of heart. It doesn't feel real at all. 
probably because the cops in the show are already pretty useless to begin with. Yeah, go back throughout the show and tell me how many times do cops actually show up or even matter. The cops have never mattered up until this point, and then the show just suddenly wanted them to. And now, it wants to do the cop that doesn't like Heroes arc? Yeah, Chief Cruz is new to town, but it still feels so weird that the show just suddenly now wants the police to matter. The only way I can see Chief Cruz working at all is if you made him a full-on antagonist. No redemption, no bullshit change of heart, just someone who needs to be taken down in the end of the day. First off, give him a motivation that actually makes sense. Make it so where there was a fight between Stan Lee and that other villain, and during the fight, Chief Cruz lost his father in it. Then he'd actually have a pretty good reason to not like heroes because they cause destruction and death sometimes. Secondly, show us the ramifications of Chief Cruz declaring Big Hero 6 as criminals. Show us more crime in the city. Show us the citizens of San Francisco actually caring about the people who saved their lives just a little bit. Make Chief Cruz a very unpopular chief amongst the citizens, but have Chief Cruz simply not give a shit about popularity. Have him be so committed to stopping heroes that eventually even his own fellow officers begin siding against him. That way, when in the season finale, when Chief Cruz buys all those robots from Crytek, he decides to just fire everybody who didn't agree with him. Turn Cruz into something like a dictator where he starts enforcing a strict curfew, arresting people for no good reason, or even speaking out against him or defending heroes. Just have Cruz be so hellbent on defending Big Hero 6 that he becomes a bit of a villain himself. That would actually be a unique subversion of the police chief that doesn't like heroes. But no, that would actually be a really interesting story, and we can't have that. No, just have all the citizens be sniveling, cowardly idiots who just accept everything at face value. Have the cops just blindly agree with Chief Cruz's methods because he's the chief, and that's just the way it is. Load these heroes up. My pleasure, sir. With pleasure? What do you mean with pleasure? Why do you hate heroes? What's your fucking problem? This whole entire thing with Chief Cruz just feels really forced. Lazy, cliche, broken, inconsistent, rushed, just really not well handled. I get why everyone doesn't like this character now. He's just a really badly written character. Even the diehards who try to defend everything in this show, no matter how bad it really is in the end, they all agree this character is the worst. But hey, at least Megan's cool, right? Yeah, no, sorry, dude, she sucks too. Megan has absolutely no personality of her own. It's actually kind of baffling how this show basically took every character's one-note personalities and just jacked them all the way up to 11, basically, and yet couldn't even give Megan a semblance of one herself. She's probably the most boring character in the show. Seriously, can you guys name one personality trait from Megan? Because I can't. With Gogo, she's cool, confident, quiet. Honey Lemon is bubbly, optimistic, and quirky. Fred is annoying, stupid, not funny in the fucking slightest. Even Carmi, as unlikable as she was, at least had a personality. She stuck up, bratty, a bitch. What's Megan's personality? Uh, uh, she's smart, I guess. Okay, well, so is almost every other character in the show. Okay, well, uh, uh, she, she's brave. Again, so is everyone else. What makes her unique? What makes her memorable and stand out on her own right? Uh, she's not a bitch like Carmi. No, that's not a personality trait. No, Megan just sucks, guys. Sure, she's not unlikable like Carmi was, but I'll probably end up remembering Carmi more. Personalities are important, and I thought for a second this show actually understood that. But as it turns out, I was wrong. Big shock, I know. There's actually an episode focusing on Fred and how he has trouble focusing on being a hero, but I don't understand why he's the one that's having trouble. Wasn't he like the only person that wanted to keep being a hero? And now suddenly he's the one that needs to be taught how to stay focused when it comes to doing hero work? He's literally the last person that needs to learn this! I get that Fred's stupid, but he loves being a hero. Certainly a lot more than all the other characters who just begrudgingly do it. There's more to a character than just a personality, but Megan really doesn't stand out all that much. All she cares about is taking photos of Big Hero 6 and exposing them because... Actually, I don't know! She just wants to do it for whatever reason. She says it'd make a good story and all, but she never gives us an actual reason outside of that. Even Hero never really tells her it's a bad idea, and honestly, I don't know why he did it. Seriously, why couldn't Hero just say, maybe the secret identities are there for a reason? Although to be fair, even the heroes themselves don't have a good reason for keeping their identities a secret in the show, so I guess Megan doesn't need her good reason either. Again guys, it's better for things to happen than to explain why they happen. Seriously, when we first meet Megan, she actually really likes Big Hero 6, and then the literal next time we see her, she's suddenly like her father and doesn't like them anymore? 
people in this city will get hurt because we won't be there to help. Have you ever thought that the city doesn't need Big Hero 6? No, I have not thought that because it's ridiculous. We have the police. I'm sorry, when did this happen? Did Chief Cruz have a conversation with Megan off screen convincing her not to like Big Hero 6 anymore? What the fuck? Sure, Hero changes her mind later, but still, you can't just have a sudden character shift like that off screen. Nobody likes that. Megan is just a fucking Mary Jane or Gwen Stacy ripoff, isn't she? I mean, seriously, think about it. Her dad's a cop, she wants to be a journalist, she's a love interest for Hero. That's about it, really. That's all her character has going for her. It honestly wouldn't surprise me at this point if both Chief Cruz and Megan sort of just disappear from the show altogether after this point, like Granville did. Well, maybe not disappear so much as just have their roles significantly reduced. Megan will just become another love interest, and her and Carmi will get into some stupid as fuck love triangle with Hero, while Chief Cruz just kinda stops appearing for the most part. And for good reason. Both these characters were just so fucking bad. And you wanna know what the worst part of it is? There's still another villain I have to talk about! I'll ask one more time because the point seriously needs to be made. Who the fuck is Trina? Well, to answer that question, Trina is a robot that was created by Obake in Season 1. She had one episode dedicated to her in Season 1. She had a cameo in the Season 1 finale. She was the main villain in the first episode of Season 2. She appeared briefly in Episodes 8 and 11. And now, suddenly, she's the main antagonist in the Season finale. Just like that! Out of all the villains in the show so far, not counting the ones who were introduced in this season, she is the villain that has had the least amount of screen time. She's mostly just been in the background of the show during this season, preparing for her big, epic plan for revenge. Off screen! Yeah. Kind of like the Green Goblin in The Amazing Spider-Man 2, she just kind of shows up and I guess is now the main antagonist? But at least Green Goblin had more build up to him. So throughout the entire season, Trina's been building these robots, again, off-screen, and in the last episode, she was able to sell them to Crytek, and Chief Cruz bought those robots from Crytek in order to stop Big Hero 6. So Trina waited until Big Hero 6 was defeated, and then had the robots turn on everybody because she wants to destroy the city, because blah blah blah, boring bland generic robot revolution, and yeah, she's, she's pretty much just hijacked the villain role from Chief Cruz because, hey, we gotta redeem Chief Cruz even though nobody fucking wanted him to be redeemed, and this way, we still have a villain to fight because God, it's so fucking stupid. Ugh. The whole entire finale just feels so out of nowhere. There was hardly any build-up to this whatsoever. You can't just have a villain set everything up off-screen, and then at the very end just have them pop out and go, Ha-ha! It was me all along! Then you get Palpatine levels of bad writing. Yeah, Palpatine, who was still alive somehow, just had a giant-ass fleet just baking in the oven this whole damn time, and now he's unleashing it in the last fucking movie? Don't you think that flea would have been more useful earlier? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that's that's for a completely different video, stay tuned. I honestly don't have that much to say about Trina because, well, what else is there to say? She's the one villain that has had the least amount of impact on this show. Honestly, I don't even know why Obake built her in the first place. Uh, apparently he did it so he could get more info on Hero, but there was literally a million other ways he could have done that. He was already pretty much stalking the team to begin with. He didn't even need to build a robot just to learn about Tadashi. Seriously, why did he even build Trina if she wasn't going to have that big of a role in his plan? She kind of just disappeared after that episode and was barely even in this season to begin with. And now she's the main antagonist? Again, this is just like with Palpatine in Rise of Skywalker. Just a forced, out of nowhere grasp of desperation that the writers had no idea how to work with. Why Trina of all people? You have other villains you can turn to. You literally were building up hard light more than Trina. Why not use him instead? Or better idea, simply have Cruz be the main villain all the way through as I said before. Or hell, have fucking Diane come back for revenge. I don't fucking know. Just anything but this. This is such a sloppy finale that feels so rushed and glossed over. I mean, seriously, did you guys know that Gogo and the others actually graduate school at the end of this episode? Yeah! They graduate from college and it's treated like it's not even that big of a deal. Again, goes to show how much these writers actually care about these characters. What should have been built up throughout the entire season, or even just a couple of episodes, was only mentioned in like one or two throwaway lines and that's it. Boom! There they are in their graduation gowns. 
Why were they even in college to begin with? What were they hoping to get out of it? What degree did they get? Never answered. We don't even see them get their fucking diplomas. All we get is some fucking bullshit, half-assed speech about Tadashi and Legacy, and it's fucking stupid. I actually find it kind of hilarious how this episode was talking about Legacy, while at the same time, the entire show basically shits all over the movie by trying super hard to be not anything like the movie at all. Don't get me wrong, I still don't like the movie, okay? It's still an overrated, mediocre piece of trash, but compared to the show, it's like Pixar quality. And I mean good Pixar quality, like Ratatouille or Toy Story 2. At least the movie has good animation, a decent lesson that it wants to put out there, and it at least knows how to give us a decent character arc. Sure, it's still a pretty cliche movie, and the side characters are still relatively pointless, but... You know, we've, we've already burnt that bridge already, haven't we? Compared to this shit show, however, which is constantly confused, poorly animated, not funny, not interesting, aimless, pointless, cliched, stupid, lame, and just plain disappointing, the movie's a fucking godsend. And do you want to know why I know that? Do you really want to know? Because this show took the one thing from the movie that actually mattered and like Frank at a house party, they fucked his shit up. So without further ado, let's talk about Hiro Hermata and why he's the worst thing in the show. Hiro Hamada should have been aborted. I honestly didn't like Hiro that much from the movie. He just didn't really stand out to me compared to other boy geniuses like Dexter or Jimmy Neutron. But with that being said though, He's fine, I guess. He's alright. I think what made him work the best was when he was with Tadashi and then later Baymax. Basically, someone that could keep his recklessness in check. Now, on both Twitter and on my YouTube community feed, I asked you guys if you believed that Hiro actually changed in any meaningful way throughout the show, and a lot of you said yes. And I actually agree with you, believe it or not. For the worst! Traitor! Yeah, the writers for the show have basically butchered what little there was to like about Hiro Hamada in the first place. In the movie, Hiro was a pretty reckless kid, but they explained that he didn't have a lot of real-world experience, and Hiro believed that his intelligence made up for that. Which it didn't. Being smart isn't going to keep you from getting beat up after you try to hustle a criminal. Of course, that was the whole point of that scene, to establish that Hiro is a reckless kid who seriously overestimates himself. He would actually go on to make the same mistake again later in the same movie when he believed that Baymax alone would be enough to stop Callahan. Which he wasn't. Hero is a kid who seriously overestimates himself. Which is why when the show began, the point of Granville trying to establish limits on the boy is actually a pretty good idea. Hero needs to learn that there are consequences to his actions. And just because he's a brilliant kid with a robot and friends looking out for him doesn't mean he's invincible. You probably noticed that I said the word need not needed. Because Hero hasn't learned a goddamn thing in the show. This all falls back to that opening argument that I made at the beginning of the video, where the show is trying to be like the movie, Kim Possible, and Teen Titans Go all at the same time. Hero in the show is, by personality, the same character, but his actions showcases that he never grows or learns from his lessons. Again, because this show can't decide whether it has a story arc or it simply wants to be episodic, this show still has to deal with the status quo where everything has to pretty much reset by the end of each episode. Remember when Hero broke his leg? Yeah, that mattered for a whopping one episode and that's it. How about when Hero returned the bot fighting for one episode and that's also it? Shouldn't that have been a recurring thing where Hero kept going back every once in a while simply because he thought it was fun? I mean, the show thought it'd be a good idea to treat it as an allegory for drug addiction, so why not have it be a recurring thing throughout season one? Hell, you could even give more purpose and even more character to Trina since she was in a bot fighting too, just saying. Every time Hero makes a mistake in the show, it usually only matters in that one instant, not in the overall plot. Usually when he makes the mistakes, the other characters just kind of brush it off and go, Oh, don't worry about it, Hero. It's all good. And whenever there's a punishment, it's never as bad as it needs to be. When Hero got grounded for going back to the bot fights, it needed to be heavier. But, like I said before, it only matters in that one instant. And that's it. The grounding is never even brought up again after that moment in the same episode. Now let's take a look at Troll Hunters, which is a criminally underrated show on Netflix. And if you haven't seen it yet, then you need to because it is so damn good. And don't worry, I'm not going to spoil anything because, again, I want you to watch it. It's a damn good show. So in the show, Jim is constantly having to lie to his mother because, you know, trolls exist and they have to stay a secret. But in the middle of season one, his mother, Barbara, becomes more and more frustrated with being lied to all the time. 
Yeah, Barbara is actually a pretty smart parent compared to what you usually see in this genre. Whenever Jim gets his ass kicked and comes home covered in bruises, she actually notices. When he sneaks out, gets in trouble with his teachers, and even the police, it keeps building up over time until eventually she has a fit, telling him that she's terrified for his safety. Now, of course, we know Jim is not a bad kid, and we know why he's lying to his mom so much, but the thing is, Jim knows that she knows that he's lying to her, and he has to do it anyway, to her face. This doesn't just wrap up after the fight, it lingers. It sticks with both of them for multiple episodes until they can finally sit down and resolve it themselves. Actions have consequences. In the Big Hero 6 movie, Hero's actions actually have consequences, and the movie acknowledged them. When Hero tried to kill Callahan, the movie called him out for it. When Hero went into the portal to save Abigail, who hasn't even appeared in the show yet, by the way. Seriously, guys, are you, like, allergic to good ideas? <laughs> anyway, Hero ended up leaving Baymax behind in the wormhole. Sure, it all worked out in the end, but Hero didn't know that it would, so the weight was still there in that moment. In the Big Hero 6 TV series, however, Hero never seems to learn his lessons. And whatever lessons he learns, it never makes an impact on anything. Not even himself. In Troll Hunters, Jim's actions move the story along and impact the rest of the characters. And as the story went on, Jim also changed and began to learn from his mistakes. That stuff involving limits? Never brought up again. Tadashi? Yet barely ever brought up, period. It almost feels like there's no real end goal for Hero's development. Every story arc has a point A and point B. And for the life of me, I can't figure out what Hero's point B is. Where is the show leading Hero to? What is Hero destined to become? In a show like Teen Titans Go or even SpongeBob SquarePants or something, those questions don't matter because clearly they don't. <laughs> but in a show like this, that has an overarching story, character progression, things like that, these questions actually do matter. What is the point I'm supposed to get from watching Hero's story? In the movie, it's very clear what Hero is supposed to learn and what he's supposed to become. It's pretty basic in execution, but it's still clear as day. In the show, however, I have no idea. It basically makes the whole show feel rather aimless and random. Hero is just constantly overestimating himself without ever learning from it. We've already talked about how Hero fell for Yama's stupid, obvious plan in the beginning of Season 1. That was stupid. So fucking stupid. He goes after the Mad Jacks alone, despite being sick and having nothing to fight them, just to prove that they were hunting Cray. Like, what were you hoping to get out of that, dude? Then there are times when Hero does something really stupid for pretty much no reason. The guy's a fucking idiot. There's the dreaded fanfiction episode where Hero accepts the shitty name that Carmi gave him, and still does later in the show. <laughs> yep, that's me. Captain Cutie. This is not funny. It's never been funny. Seriously, how hard is it for here to just look Kermy dead in the eye and just say, You're not affiliated with me. There was a time when Megan learned the truth about who Big Hero 6 was, and Hero just outright told her. Me. I know who Big Hero 6 is. You. Now you can't tell anyone. Dude, why are you admitting to it? She didn't have any proof. Sure, she had that board and all, but that is, at its best, an educated guess. Not evidence. I'm not mad that Megan figured it out. I'm mad that Hero didn't even try to hide it. He just gave up in that instant. For someone who really wants to keep their identity a secret, he seems to just throw in the towel whenever someone just hints at possibly knowing the truth. Yeah, I think the fucking Game Grumps summed up perfectly why this is such a problem. You like Dark Knight Rises, right? No. You didn't? No. Okay. A movie. lot of people hated it. That movie's hilariously bad. I think I loved it. Really? Yeah. I get why people would like it, right. but, like, there's there's too much in that movie that, like, immediately took me out of it. Like, uh, when Robin shows up, oh, sorry, spoilers. When he shows up and he's like, What, what day you, you showed up in my orphanage and I, I knew you were Batman. And he's like, yeah, Batman. And it's like, wait, what? Why yeah. would you just confirm it? Yeah, well, yeah, real Batman would have been like, no. <laughs> Stupid. Uh, I was at the ice cream shop getting mochi green tea ice cream <laughs> when Batman w Shut up! <laughs> it's just always so aggravating whenever Hero has to do something stupid like that just to move the plot along sometimes. You'd figure for a boy genius, he wouldn't keep making stupid decisions like that. He never talks to his friends, he never talks to Baymax, he just kind of does whatever he wants with no fucks given. But not in a fun way like Spike, more like an annoying way like Gary. 
And whenever he finally does talk to them, it's usually at the very end of the episode where the lesson is learned. But again, Hiro never learns his lesson. Everything resets back to normal by the beginning of the next episode. And by everything, I mean some things. Yeah, see how confusing that sounds? I don't know what's meant to be taken as serious development for Hiro's character, or just a one-off lesson that doesn't matter to the overall story arc. It really speaks volumes to how confusing the show's tone can be. However, there is this one moment that really pissed me off. I mean, seriously. Seriously pissed me off. It actually succeeded in making me hate Hiro more than any other character in the show. More than Gogo, more than Cruz, and yes, even more than Carmi. You may make the jokes in the comments if you wish. This moment seriously made me question whether or not the writers even watched the movie at all. It's seriously insane how bad this moment was. Have you ever loved a TV show, or a movie, or even a movie franchise, and it was going super great for a while, but then suddenly, everything changed? Like, there was just this one moment in the movie, or TV show, or whatever, that just pretty much ruins it for you, or puts a really bad taste in your mouth? A good example for me would be the Mary Poppins scene from The Last Jedi. Yeah, I think everyone pretty much agrees that scene was pretty dumb. In my last video, I stated that the only way this show had a chance of redemption at this point would simply be to give it the American Dragon treatment, where a new director would come in and take it to a whole new direction. Well, remember when I said I kind of regret making that last video and I should have just waited? This is the reason why I should have waited. This moment to me was so irrevocably stupid that it ruins any chance of redemption for me. In my humble opinion, there is no hope for this show left now. This moment happens in episode 12, the beginning of the two-part finale for the City of Monsters arc. So allow me to set the scene, man. So in this episode, Carmi and Hiro have to work together because Carmi needed help with her internship at Sycorax, and Hiro was able to do so by making nanobots on a molecular level. Because they work so well together for two whole minutes, not only does this mean they're falling in love, this also means that when Diane discovers Hiro's identity thanks to Momokaze, seriously though, what took you so long in telling her that? That means that Kami can be used against him. Yeah, not Aunt Cass, not his friends, Kami. This is just the skin of it, guys. Now, keep in mind that Kami does not know that Hiro is a part of Big Hero 6. I say this because after Diane attacks Kami and implants the monster chip in her neck, she calls Hiro to come save her because... Why not call the cops? I mean, after all, they've always been there, haven't they? Again, she doesn't know that he's in Big Hero 6, so why is she calling Normal Hero for help? What does she think he's gonna do against Diane? Believe it or not, this is actually the least stupid part of this whole scene. So Hero and Baymax go to save Carmi alone, because it's only logical that Hero and Baymax go alone, obviously. Yeah, Hero says there's not much time, but he knows they're running into a trap, basically. So Hero is just overestimating himself again for the upteenth time, and oh my god, what a fucking shocker. It turns out to be a trap. Baymax gets knocked out, and Hero has to save Carmi alone. Now this is the moment we've been waiting for. The moment so profoundly dumb, it pretty much shattered what little faith I had left in this show. I'm going to play it for you guys real quick so you in quarantine can try and figure it out for yourselves. Carmi! Hero? Lives outside. Now what? Did you guys see it? Let's do it one more time. Carmi! Hero? Lives outside. Now what? How about that time? One more time, and then I'm going Super Saiyan on this bitch. Carmi! Hero? Lives outside. Now what? Did you guys figure it out yet? Let me tell you what went wrong in this scene. <clears throat> in this scene, Hero took his fucking suit off! Why in the fuck did he take his damn suit off? What the fuck is wrong with you, man? Your best friend is being attacked outside, you have no backup coming for, as far as you know, a while, and you decided that the best option in this particular moment is to take your fucking armor off? WHY WOULD YOU DO THAT?! Okay, 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 so I know why he did it, but it still doesn't change the fact that this was still an insanely stupid thing for Hero to do. Carmi doesn't know that Hero is a part of Big Hero 6. Carmi called Hero to come save her, so it'd be kind of weird if Captain Cutie showed up instead of Hero. That's why he took his costume off. Now, I know you guys are probably expecting a joke about Carmi or something,
But I want you guys to forget about Kami for a second, okay? This has nothing to do with her. This has everything to do with Hiro right now. Regardless of the fact that it's Kami that he's saving, Hiro, in a split-second decision, believed that his secret identity was more important in that moment than saving a life. Again, the fact that it's Kami is completely irrelevant. Hiro thought it was more important that he kept his identity a secret in this life or death situation where someone had to help. Kami needed a hero, and Hiro put himself over her safety. Now, some of you may be thinking that I'm overthinking this moment. It's not that big of a deal, Razor. Hiro was just trying not to get caught, and it's not like Kami was gonna die, so come on, is it really that big of a deal? Besides, the moment lasts like a minute, and it's at the very end of the episode. Well, I think it matters, because Hiro, the character, would never do this. Hero has proven to me in the past that helping people is more important than his fucking identity. And do you know when that happened? In the movie. Where his character was a hell of a lot more consistent. Right before the final battle with Callahan at Kratek, do you remember when Hero took his mask off there? So he could try and talk to Callahan and try to convince him to stop what he was doing? Even if it didn't work in the end, Hero still tried to help someone who needed help. In that particular moment, Hero didn't take into consideration that there were possibly hundreds of bystanders nearby that could recognize him. Hell, he revealed himself to Cray, who he had no attachment to at the time. In that moment, Hero cared more about helping someone than keeping his identity a secret. But in this moment, it's literally the opposite. His identity came first before helping someone. This moment wasn't just stupid in context of the episode, but it was also insanely out of character for Hero in general. This is not the Hero from the movie. So yeah, Hero did change from the movie in a meaningful way. For the worst. And it doesn't help the fact that Kami turned into a monster anyway, and at that moment kidnapped Hero to take in the Sycorax so Diane could force him to save Liv. Basically, because Hero didn't have a suit on, he wouldn't be able to fight back against Kami and you- Oh! That's why he went in alone! So that way, Hero could easily be captured without any of the other characters getting in the way! And hey, while we're at it, have Hero take his fucking suit off so he can't fight back against Kami or Diane when he gets the sticker axe. Man, <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but that shit flowed so damn well. Yeah, like my ass against sandpaper, maybe. This whole entire sequence is just an abysmal fucking plot contrivance. Again! You had Hero not only going alone, just so he could get kidnapped without any hustle from the other characters, but you also had Hero break his own character, just so Kami wouldn't learn the truth, and to also make it easier for him to get kidnapped? Yeah, I get the episode was ending, but seriously, guys, the writing here is just fucking awful. God awful, in fact. I am seriously convinced these writers have either never seen the movie before, or only saw it one time and decided that would be enough. It really shows in certain instances that they did not do their homework when it came to writing their scripts. The attention is in the detail, and when it's not there, it's very noticeable. Come on guys, I'm not a thief, I'm a bot fighter. There's no crime in that. Actually, there is. Oh, that explains so much. Bot fighting is not illegal. Betting on bot fighting, that's, that's illegal, but... So they should have known that when making this show. They don't care about these characters. They don't care about this world. They don't care about Hiro or Tadashi or the animation or hell. They don't even care about the fucking fans. Seriously, guys, remember the fan art thing that I brought up in the last video? Turns out it was true. The animators stole fan art from someone and claimed it as their work. Again, for anyone that told me that I should respect the hard work put into the show, y'all can kiss my ass. I don't respect this kind of theft. It's disgusting, and I don't fucking condone it one bit. Even if a good show does it, it still just feels wrong in every way. Not to mention the animators keep sexualizing Gogo every chance they get. Yeah, remember this glorious picture? Yeah. And for anyone who thinks I'm overthinking this and is just looking for more things to hate, the animators for the show have actually admitted to sexualizing Gogo in the show. Twice! They're sexualizing a character in a kid's show, and everyone on the team was pretty much okay with it. There's a fine line between having a thick, sexy female in a kid's show, and this. I shouldn't have to explain what the difference is. Everything about this show is just a goddamn mess, from the outside and inside. I honestly cannot believe how seriously fucked up this show has become. I never would have guessed 
that when this show was first announced back in like, what, 2015, I think, that it would become this absolute travesty of a series. And at this point, I think, I think I'm pretty much done with it. Like, for real, done with the show. I don't even know if I'm going to bother with season three at this point. Yeah, I heard it was the final season, which in my opinion is a good thing. But at this point, I'm seriously just considering washing my hands of the show for good. I mean, seriously, how much lower can this show go? It's clearly not interested in exploring the characters or expanding on the world. It just wants to be another one of those shows. And it can't even be one of those shows because this show is such a tonal fucking mess. But watching Hero completely and utterly betray his own character, his own beliefs that someone has to help, tells me everything I need to know about the future of the show. It will not improve. It refuses to get better. Only a pure, unrelenting reboot of the show can save this world and these characters now. But as for what we got, it's not going to get better. And that's because the show itself told me it wouldn't. Everybody kind of agrees that making fun of your critics is a pretty tactless and childish thing to do. Whenever Teen Titans Go does it, or when Thundercats Roar did it, it was usually met with negative feedback. Especially when Thundercats Roar did it. And do I even need to talk about the whole Daddy Derek and Mama Fishman thing again? Yeah, I don't think so. Criticism has its place in the world. It's not a pointless thing where people are just looking for something to hate. It's a legit thing that exists so that movies and TV shows can get better from it. But in the end, it all depends on how you take the criticism. Which brings me to talk about the second fanfiction episode. Yes, they actually made a second one. Despite the fact that the first one was pretty much hated by everyone. Even the diehard fans didn't like that episode, but the writers decided, well, we're gonna do another one anyway. And this episode's gonna talk about how we don't give a fuck. I'm not even kidding when I say that. Basically, this whole episode is just an extended version of those stupid chibi shorts from YouTube that they're not making anymore, and for good reason, because they were just getting really weird, as I said before. So the episode begins with Professor Granville, a science teacher, telling her students to write fan fiction because it will make them better scientists? What? Challenging your imaginations makes you better thinkers. Better thinkers or better scientists? Or this stuff keeps us from actual science. Yeah, I'm with Hero on this one, and I literally just got done ripping him a new one like two minutes ago. Or this stuff keeps us from actual science. A strong opinion from an uninformed source. Oh, is that what you think he is? <laughs> okay then, I mean, it's not like he created a revolutionary device in the movie or anything- OH WAIT A MINUTE, HE DID! Yeah, he doesn't need to join your fucking book club, Granville. Carmen? Would you please read the first chapter of your story? Of course! Oh my god, this is just another fucking excuse to pander to Carmi, isn't it? GOD FUCKING DAMN IT! See, this is proof in the pudding that they're gonna bring Carmi back! They are too goddamn proud of her to leave her behind the way they did! Problem, weirdo? Yeah, a whole list of them. Instead of criticism, might I suggest creation? It's almost like she's talking directly towards me. It's almost like, if you don't like what we're doing here, maybe you should try and make a TV show. Oh, trust me, if I had a couple million dollars and a team of animators, then I would. <laughs> trust me, I would. For starters, I'd go to Studio Trigger for my animation because those mad lads are making art, okay? Say what you want about the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles show, but you can't deny the animation from that show is fucking sick. Also, their new show, Lego Monkey Kid? Dude, a show based on Legos does not have the right to look this good. Holy shit. Secondly, I would actually give a rat's ass about the damn story, and the characters, and the tone, and the writing, and the comedy. And thirdly, I wouldn't let my animators steal fucking fan art. Or sexualize a character in a kid's show like this. So by all means, guys, keep telling me to do better. I bet I fucking could. 
But no. Just keep making jokes about being meta and shit. That's totally a new thing to do. Maybe write what you know. All I know is I hate writing. Ooh, writing about how you hate writing would be like meta. Super meta. Yeah, but it's also really lazy and nowhere near as funny as most people think that it is. God, this is so fucking painful. And being told to my face that you're not even gonna try and improve is pretty much the nail in the coffin for me. You really are fine with this shit, aren't you? It's fucking ridiculous. And people expect me to leave it alone or respect the hard work put into the show. What a fucking joke. God. Cheap looking flash, insufferable characters, insulting pandering theft and shit. This whole show is fucking garbage. I honestly have no idea how people can enjoy this show. It pretty much spits in the face of the movie. And the movie was pretty mediocre to begin with. I should not hate Big Hero 6 as much as I do. The movie was average, okay? Average, passable, fluff, and that's it. It should not affect me to this level, and yet it has. I don't know. Maybe hate isn't the right word. I think the right word to use is disappointment. I really did want to like this show because I really wanted to like the movie. But where the movie failed, the series could have improved upon, kind of like how the Star Wars Clone Wars series improved upon the prequels and even its own movie. But the fact that this show can't even be a good spin-off of the movie just kind of irked me. Maybe I had my expectations way too high for this show, but honestly, can you blame me? When you look at all the other animated shows on TV at the time, and right now, compared to this... My brain hates my eyes for seeing this. It only makes sense. We've got a lot more gold than turrets nowadays, and it's been pretty consistent like that since 2010. Adventure Time, Regular Show, Gravity Falls, Star vs. The Loud House, Steven Universe, Tangled the Series, Trollhunters and Three Below, DuckTales 2017, The Owl House, the list goes on. Now, don't get me wrong, none of these shows are perfect. The whole white diamond thing on Steven Universe did feel pretty rushed and not well developed. Adventure Time is one of those shows that honestly made the right decision to end when it did because it was starting to face seasonal rot. With regular show, Mordecai's romance subplot was honestly very unsatisfying. Mordecai should have totally married CJ instead of some random bat lady. There I said it! And Star vs. the Forces of Evil's final season was actually really bad. Like holy shit, that was awful. That's like the Game of Thrones of animation right there. But like I said before, there's more gold than turds out there. And usually the turds look like this. The 2010s were actually pretty good in terms of TV animation, but we definitely got stinkers. And Big Hero 6 the series is no exception. Maybe it's not the worst show to come out in the last decade, but it's probably for me the most disappointing all the way through. And all the theft, pandering bullshit, and gross misconduct just adds fuel to the fire. And that is why Big Hero 6 The Series Season 2 is actually god-awful. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go watch something good from Disney. Like, maybe I'll rewatch The Mandalorian again. That's a great show. Or, hell, maybe I'll go watch an old classic like Robin Hood. Yeah, I love that movie. Or, maybe I'll even go watch... Oh, no.